Hello, my name is Nathan Wood, and today I want to talk about one of the most famous pieces of armor in history, or otherwise it's famous for being a suit of armor known as medieval plate. The European plate armor that we know today arose after chain mail. Chain mail was made out of iron rings held together by rivets, so the armor could follow the body's contours and allow the movement to be accessible. Mm-hmm. Medieval plate armor, as we know, evolved from different armors other than chain mail, such as the coat of plates, scale armor, penny plate, and even had its roots traced back to La Rocca Cementa, a particularly Roman armor. Plate armor became prevalent by the second quarter of the 14th century, as knights started using steel plate over chain mail, becoming more popular as the time went on. Full plates then began to extend over the whole of the body and would gradually take shape as the armor we know today. By the 15th century, the typical knight was covered head to toe in plate armor that closely followed the contours of the body, making him nearly invulnerable to everything except heat exhaustion along with really heavy arrows and heavy blunt weapons. There were many different variations in knight's armor for a multitude of different needs, like jousting, parades, or simple combat, but the central aspects remained the same. The armor itself was made out of either iron or steel, consisting of many different pieces. From bottom to top, plates extended up and encased the lower legs and the top of the foot. This part was known as the sabaton. The knees were then encased with a circular cup with a wing at the side to deflect attacks, and cusis that encased the upper leg to protect from blade strikes. Several horizontal strips of metal encircled the hips running up the waist, known as falds, until they reached the waist where they tempered, tempered into, tapered into the waist uh, to allow the knight to bend his bend and twist freely. The breastplate that was also tapered into the waist then covered the majority of the knight's vital organs along with the back plate that was connected to the breastplate. The hands were protected by gauntlets, which could have had small plates along the fingers for better articulation, or they could have had been almost fully encased at the top of the hand for better protection, almost like a steel mitten. The arms were protected similar to the legs and were encased in steel plates, the lower counter for the ar- for the forearm and the upper counter for the upper arm, respectively. They had a circular piece to protect the elbow, also known as simply a counter, along with a wing known as a spalder at the shoulder. The whole arm ensemble stretched from the forearm to the upper arm was known as a vambrace. A circular disc or a besague protected the armpit and the exposed area between the arm and the chest plates. An alternative was the pauldron, which wrapped around the entire shoulder. Helmets varied between the European nations and the knights themselves, but some of the most common were among the great helm, the bassinet, and the closed helm, with the neck then protected by a steel gorget, or a neck guard, as we would say. A chainmail shirt or even padded clothing that was worn under the armor with chainmail segments guarding the exposed joints where steel plates could not be placed, otherwise known as an arming doublet, would be worn by the knights. Knights often wore a surcoat or a jupon over the top of the armor. All in all, the armor was held together by laces, straps, and hinges. With the help of a squire or two, could be put on in 10 minutes. The full armor was about 45 to 55 pounds on average, but was distributed over the entire body so the knight could maneuver with some freedom.